Hello. Today, another basics video, as I'm calling them. And this time I'm going to explain why in my videos I typically write my for loops counting down rather than up. Now, there are obviously some times when I need to count upwards, but quite often I write loops where I count down using I minus minus when I'm iterating through things like the list of orders or the list of positions. There are reasons for that, and I often explain that it's because if I'm passing through that loop because I want to delete trades, then if I delete one from the stack, then a bit like Jenga, everything above it will pack down. And if I'm counting upwards, I can skip an order or a position by doing that. That's certainly true, but it's not the only reason. And I'm going to explain why I prefer to use I minus minus and count down. Um, and I'll write some code to show you what I'm talking about. But I'm also going to explain a little bit more about how the for loop works and why I do that. Um, and there are more reasons than just to avoid that cascading impact of deleting orders. So let me just start. Here is a typical for loop. All right, so that's a loop where I might be looping through all of the orders. This is the MetaTrader 4 editor, but what I'm going to be explaining is the same for MetaTrader 5. I'm starting here by initializing int i equals orders total minus 1. So orders total returns the total number of orders, but the array of orders is zero indexed, so I need to begin at orders total minus 1, and I'm going to count through all of the orders with i greater than or equal to zero, so it'll count all the way down to the bottom. Uh, and I use the I minus minus to do that. Let me explain first how these four statements work. This section up to the first semicolon is the initialization of the for loop. This is the end condition and this is the increment that happens. I could rewrite that in quite a different way. So here is a completely different way, let me just add a space there, a completely different way to do the same thing. I initialize i to orders total minus one. That's the same statement that I have here. Here's the same terminating condition, i greater than or equal to zero and i minus minus. But what this demonstrates is when these things happen. That initialization statement happens once only. This terminating condition is evaluated at the beginning of every loop. So including the first loop, this is tested. And this i minus minus, or whatever increment I have, happens at the end of the loop. So simply reading the for statement, you might look at these almost happening at the same time, but they actually happen in this order. This is once only, this is at the beginning of a loop, and this is the last thing that happens in a loop before we go back to evaluate this statement again. Now, while a for loop typically uses something like an integer counting through an array of things, this initialization statement can be initializing anything. So I could initialize, for example, a total profit. Uh, let me rewrite this. So here I've rewritten the for statement. I'm initializing total profit to zero while the total profit is less than required and I have nothing here. Oh, that needs to be a no bracket. And then what I'll do in here is something like plus equals something. I might be looking at uh, a particular order or anything. So there's no requirement at all to have a value here. And there's no requirement to have a value here. And there's no requirement to have anything here. All of these are optional. As long as you think of the for loop working like this, then there's an initialization, which you may or may not use. There's an end condition, which you may or may not use, because you can easily have something in here that simply says, I've had enough, I'm just going to jump out of the loop or return from this function. And there's an increment, which you may or may not use. So just because for loops are typically written as looping with an iterating value, like the i equals orders total, that doesn't mean they have to be written that way. If I compile this now, um, I'm just going to put a number there so this will compile. 
right, that compiles. So the compiler is quite happy to have a for loop with nothing here. I can delete that and compile again. It's still quite happy. Uh, I can't delete this because I'm actually using total profit, but if I declare total profit there, I can have a for statement that has nothing in any of these and it will simply loop forever until I have a statement inside here somewhere that will exit the for statement. So that's the first really important thing about for statements. You have to think of them as operating in these three distinct steps. Initialization, optional. Exit condition, optional. And increment, optional. And the increment doesn't even have to increment a value. It could just be any statement. So now, why do I write these loops counting down rather than counting up. If you remember that this statement happens once only, in here, I'm calling a function, orders total. And I might be looping through an array, so this might be array size of some kind of array. Functions require processing power. If I rewrite the statement like this, if I rewrite it like this, then I will initialize i, that's the first statement. Then I will evaluate this at every loop. At the beginning of every loop, I'll be evaluating that. And that means on every loop, I'm going to call a function. You probably don't have a lot of orders. It's not a big hit, but it is a performance hit. If this were an array of maybe thousands of bars that I'm looking through, then it means I'm going to be looking at array size function, for example, at every loop. And then of course, I++, that's just the increment. But what I'm trying to avoid is multiple calls to this function. Now I could do that by simply having a variable at the beginning here and say count equals orders total while i is less than count. But it's an extra statement that I don't need if I'm prepared to do this. Right at the beginning, I did say there are some situations where you might want to count up. So if I am looking through an array of bar values like open prices, closed prices and so on, perhaps I need to know the value from the bar before in order to calculate my next result. And then I might need to use the I++. And in that case, I will get the number of iterations into a variable at the beginning rather than call that function on every loop. But typically, I will write my loops like this. So I'm evaluating this function once, and then I'm counting down using the minus minus. And if it helps you, you can always think of a for loop as working like this. You can even write them like this if you want to, but this is a little bit cumbersome. And also, if you look at scope, this is MetaTrader 4 and I have property strict. MetaTrader 5 doesn't need the property strict statement. The i variable in here has scope only within this for statement, where if I declare it this way, then that i variable has scope outside the loop. Uh, and it's just neater to have a variable that simply disappears at the end of the loop. And then I can use it again, which is why I have the int statement here twice. I should be able to compile it. I don't think I've made any mistakes there. Yes. So I can use int i twice here, but if I use this syntax, let me just duplicate this. And if I tried to perform this as the second statement, And now if I compile, I should get an error because I is already defined and I'm defining it again there. Now I can simply remove the int, but I just find it easier to use the for statement, declare this inside the statement, and then it disappears from scope when I'm finished. Now it is absolutely true, as I often say, that if I'm running through the orders and I'm deleting an order, then the list of orders will compress and I could miss one if I'm counting upwards. But the real reason that I do this is simply to avoid calling these functions more than once. And I don't really like creating extra variables outside that hold this count, uh, simply because again, it's another variable to put into scope and I just find this quite neat and easy to use. So that's a simple explanation of why my loops count backwards. As I said, this code is the same for MetaTrader 4 and 5, so the same concepts apply. And this processing 
happens the same way for MetaTrader 4 and 5. There's the initialization that happens once, the test that happens at the beginning of every loop, and the iteration that happens at the end. If you found this useful, click the like button. If you want to see more of our videos, click subscribe and then click the bell icon to be notified when we release the next video. Thank you for watching.